Okay. Thank you for that interruption. That was that was good. Um, unfortunately, what I already said won't be recorded, but such is life. So I was saying in the progressive movement in the early 20th century, uh, ranked choice voting, proportional ranked choice voting, proportional representation was adopted by a couple of dozen cities, including big ones like Cincinnati, Cleveland, and New York City. And then in the late 40s, 50s mostly, it was repealed because it actually worked. It opened up the political system. Black people were elected, women were elected. And in New York City, third parties, mostly on the left, were elected. And in the you know Red Scare and Carthyism of the 50s, most cities got rid of it. So we started over in the early 2000s. Greens are right in the middle of this. And we've had a steady growth of cities adopting ranked choice voting. We're up to about 20 going into the 2020 election. And it's really accelerated since then. Uh, we now have 51 jurisdictions using it, including two states, three counties, and 46 cities. It reaches about 13 million voters. And if you add in the jurisdictions that the Nevada referendum that passed, it has to pass a second time because it's changing their constitution, the number of jurisdictions is well over 100. Uh, so this is a movement that's growing, and Green should be in the middle of it. And also, a uh, proportional ranked choice voting is growing. Uh, that's ranked choice voting in multi-seat districts, which in, you end up with proportional representation of the different uh, political tendencies or parties. And that includes Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, Cambridge, Massachusetts, the boards in Minneapolis, East Point, Michigan, Albany, California. And many of these were initiated by ethnic minorities that were underrepresented, like Asians in Albany or African Americans in East Point, and a coalition of people of color in Portland, Oregon, which just passed last year. 30 states now have ranked choice voting legislation introduced. It's going to be on the ballot in Oregon in 2024 and in the District of Columbia this fall. And when I'm done, I'm going to put a couple of links in about where it's being used from fair vote. And then with respect to presidential elections, Rob Ritchie, who's headed up Fair Vote Forever, uh, was co-author of an article about how we can get ranked choice voting in a national popular vote for president without having to do a constitutional amendment, but by legislation. And they make the legal argument there that the constitution already gives Congress that power. So that I think people should take a look at. Second point, proportional ranked choice voting for legislative bodies. We've got to push for that. We can't settle for single district ranked choice voting uh, for legislative bodies because we won't get our fair share of representation. It won't be proportional. Um, and, you know, political minorities is not just the Green Party, it's the members of major parties who are the minority in their district. Most districts are not competitive. 95% of state legislative districts, 90% of House districts are landslides. They are one party districts. So that's what's wrong with the winner take all plurality system. I'll give you an example from Australia. The Green Party there is a 10 to 13% party in the national vote in recent elections. Um, in the Senate, which is multi seat ranked choice voting, they get proportional results. In the House, where it's single seat ranked choice voting, they don't. So right now in the Senate, coming out of the 2022 elections, the Greens have uh, 12 of the 76 senators with senators, which is 16%, which is close to the 13% they got in that election. However, in the House, they've had only one out of 151 seats for several elections. In the last one, they ended up with four because of some really extraordinary grassroots organizing. But still, uh, four out of uh, 151 is a pitiful 2.5% when they got 13% uh, nationwide. And when it was one, it was less than 1%. So that shows why it's so important. If we settle for single seat ranked choice voting for legislative bodies, when we fight for these reforms, it's still gonna be a winner take all system. It'll be ranked choice voting, but there's only one winner in each district. And that's not proportional. So that's the second key point. And then the third point is that, uh, we have a movement now that rich people are funding for nonpartisan primaries. They call it top five uh, 
It's like top two in California or top four in Alaska. And so you have a top five uh, open primary. They call it open. It's not really open. Open means a party primary where non-party members can vote. And that's allowable in some states. It's mandatory in some. It's optional in others. This is a non-party, non-partisan primary. And it's all comers. So like, you know, California Greens have endorsed candidates for their top two system. And then other people say, I'm a green, and they put the green label by their name, pay the filing fee. So you got a bunch of greens on that jungle primary at the beginning, and the rank and file green doesn't know who the party endorsed. So it's a party destroying reform. And rich folks like that because then they can buy the winners of those uh, nonpartisan primaries. And this is being pushed by some really big fat cats like LinkedIn's Reed Hoffman, who's a billionaire, big funder of centrist Democrats. And Ken Griffin, who's a hedge fund billionaire, big funder of conservative or right-wing Republicans. And Rupert Murdoch, you know, of uh, Fox News, et cetera. His uh, daughter-in-law, Karen Murdoch. These are big funders of this movement and they're doing ballot initiatives. Um, you know, they, they were behind the uh, initiatives in uh, Alaska in 2020 and Nevada in 2022. They plan to have initiatives in California, Ohio, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming in 2024. In other words, a top five primary followed by a ranked choice general election. Uh, those ballot initiatives are likely coming to a state near you. And we need to oppose this because it, it undermines the integrity of our party and parties generally. And uh, it takes away, you know, one of our most important functions, which is for us to choose our own nominees. With these uh, nonpartisan primaries, the rich folks are going to choose who makes it to the final five or final four, in the case of California, final two, by ranked choice voting. So I'm saying our slogan in response to these ballot initiatives should be ranked choice voting, yes, top five, no. So my time is up and it's now Linda's turn. So take it away, Linda Timpson. You're muted, Linda. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. That's what I get for trying to share a screen and unmute at the same time. So I'm so glad to be here and uh, to be sharing an alternative proposal to the final five top four. Yes. Okay. So um, now, my name is Linda Templin. I'm also the executive director at Ranked Choice Voting for Colorado. And uh, I have heard that there is finally a little wiggle room um, among the uh, final five top four people. Uh, so I'm hoping they can um, work with us again because we've been away from our, uh, anyway. They've been trying to block us out of our own state. So that's been awesome. Okay, so moving on. Um, so the reason why Harvard Business School and other fat cats are um, promoting the uh, final five top four is ranked choice voting threatens the capitalist homogen homogeny. And so, um, what they're doing with this is it's still a plurality primary, so they can um, still sap support from a populist candidate by adding in a spoiler. And uh, one of the things we saw, it got implemented in Alaska um, and in races where there were more than four candidates. Uh, no minor party made it to the ballot. So we, you know, suspected this was not going to be good for the, um, oh, there's folks in the waiting room, just going to say, whoever's running this. Um, 
so uh, we know that um, we suspected it wasn't going to be good. And then in practice, we saw that it was not. So um, now part of the reasons for the pressures for it is that it makes space for our um, business re leaders to run as independents. Uh, and there's also its publicity for emerging parties. And there's a few people in the major parties that have been flexible to this because there's competition in the major parties to, you know, who's going to uh, make it to the ballot. So uh, that it gives them more than one lane. They like that. So that's a, a thing to be mindful of. Um, now, alternatives to final five top four is one don't change the primaries leave them alone that's one possibility um another possibility is um to use ranked choice with it you know and then again that's up to you in your state you know what makes sense but um you know the idea that there's people supporting any kind of plurality election is ridiculous um, and then what I'm putting forth is a max three primary. So that's that the major parties go back to, I mean, I, in Colorado, I'd love to see them go back to having closed primaries because when we have ranked choice, we won't need open primaries, you know, because people are doing negative voting. They're voting for whoever they think their team can beat. So it's, it's not a good system. Um, so this this would give um, this has been used in Australia, and it's like a single transferable vote, which is the technical name for proportional ranked choice voting, except there's no surplus transfer. There's the nerd speak. But here is um, uh, it uses a ranked choice ballot. So we know people like it. Uh, people say it's easy to use. That's like 95, 90 percent of voters say the ranked choice ballot is easy. Awesome. The um, win threshold is 25%. Um, uh, the Democrats used something like this in 2020. It was a max five instead of a max three. And this was for their primary delegate um, selection. Okay, so you get the ranked choice ballot. So I give you an example, the flower party, uh, where we have sunflower, which of course I rank number one. Um, squash flower, they're delicious. Uh, wild rose, also pretty and uh, useful for uh, skincare potions and the noxious creeping Jenny I put in last place. All right, so that's the ballot. Super and easy. All right, so next up, we do a tally. In the current system, Sunflower would win because they have the most votes. Okay, but 55% of the voters didn't pick that, so people aren't going to be 100% thrilled. Um, with the max three, we've got the 25% threshold. Um, so we see Sunflower won handily with 45% of the vote. For proportional, because there's a set number of seats, you'd transfer this surplus. We don't do that with this version, right? Because there isn't a set number of seats to fill. So we just eliminate whoever's in last place. That's wild rose. So we hop to the next and we see that most of those votes would go to squash flower and sunflower. And we see squash flower also passes the, the threshold and makes it onto the ballot for the general election. So that's how it works. It's worked in other countries. I think, um, you know, it would stand a legal challenge here in the States because it's still one person, one vote. And that's what um, my organization is putting forth in Colorado as part of our overall plans to move towards proportional representation. So we're hoping for a statewide ballot measure in 2024 for ranked choice voting. We're, we're pitching this to the parties that to the major parties to use this for their um, uh, for their um, primaries, and that we'll be looking at having a um, proportional representation measure in 2026. Knock on wood. So with that, I'm going to cede my time. I hope I didn't go over. 
um, because I am really excited to hear about California because there's a, um, a voting rights act there and there's been cities adopting uh, proportional ranked choice voting to come into compliance with this state legislation. I think Ojai is one of those cities that um, council put it, uh, referred it to the ballot for that reason. So I'm excited to hear about that and uh, learn if that's something we can use in Colorado. So with that, I'm gonna stop my share, um, agitate that the um, there's two people in the waiting room and I'm gonna mute myself. Take it away, Michael. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Mike Feinstein from Santa Monica, California. And I'm going to speak about the experience that the Green Party of Los Angeles County right now has had in lobbying for proportional ranked choice voting in a larger city council for the city of Los Angeles. And then to Linda's uh, point, actually, um, now that she raised it, there are some issues about the California Voting Rights Act and a lawsuit that my city is in. But I'm going to focus on L.A. County and L.A. City here. So it's been the position of the Green Party of L.A. County for a very, very long time that we want to see a larger city council for Los Angeles elected by proportional ranked choice voting. And the reason for that is that Los Angeles, the city, has the worst per capita representation for any city council in the United States. Only 15 members for 4 million people. And that brings uh, a variety of problems, which I'll go into. And while we've made noise about making that kind of change, we really haven't gotten any traction until recently. Some of you may be familiar that in the end of uh, 2022, in the city of Los Angeles, a recording surfaced of three Los Angeles city council members and a LA County labor leader, all Latinos and Latinas, who were recorded with incredibly racist statements regarding the uh, redistricting process for LA City Council against African-American representation and against a lot of other groups uh, in the city. These were shocking, shocking, ugly comments and revelations. And what it did is it spurred the LA City Council to look at reform of the redistricting process. There had already been a motion in place for the council to look at an independent redistricting commission because the LA City Council controls the redistricting in the city of LA. The charter review commission process we had in the late 90s changed it from directly the city council um, controlling the process and, and doing the maps to each council member and a couple of other LA officials each appointing somebody to a commission. They would make a recommendation of the council and then the council would still go ahead and decide the final product. So once this happened, it came back to the council and there were two motions made, one to look at an independent redistricting commission or an IRC, and a second one to look at the size of the council and to increase the council. And those motions happened last October and the council voted to set up an ad hoc committee on Los Angeles gover governance reform. Now, Greens and many ranked choice voting advocates, because we have a California RCV statewide organization, we were advocating for the council to set up a charter review commission that would be a more in-depth, publicly oriented process to look at these changes and to look at them in conjunction with proportional representation. However, the council did not vote to do that. And instead, they went ahead and, and started this process. Now, how have Greens participated in this process and where is it leading? We have made the argument in writing to this ad hoc committee there, and there's a process in LA to submit public comments to all the items, um, even before public hearings, that an independent redistricting commission, an IRC, will not be sufficient to address the issues that we've had in Los Angeles, because as long as you keep single seat districts, even if an IRC draws the lines, you're still going to be favoring uh, some people over others by linking some voters together with others and having it be winner take all. And in a city as diverse as Los Angeles, never 
inevitably you're going to be um, pitting one protected group under the California Voting Rights Act against another group for representation. And even within those groups, you have class divisions as well. So one issue that it would not address is that. Also, we've had a terrible problem with corruption. Um, several Los Angeles council members have been indicted because the large individual single seat districts give a lot of power to individual people. And um, another problem that we've had is that Los Angeles has contingent runoffs where there is a spring election and then a runoff to November. And what often happens is there's only two candidates in the spring election, or even if there's more than two, somebody gets a majority in the spring election, but the spring election is a lower turnout and more white and less diverse and higher income electorate. So you have a uh, smaller and less diverse electorate going ahead and picking the winner compared to if you had a ranked choice November general election. So we've made this case first in a uh, formal letter to the process. And then um, I've attended a couple of the meetings of the ad hoc committee and made this testimony. And you can see it's, it's seven council members. It's a minority of the 15, um, but the largest that they could have on this committee where it's been opening a lot of eyes. They really hadn't considered this. They thought they were being really progressive with an IRC and a slightly larger council. And it's kind of been blowing their mind but they haven't really known what to do with this. And then um, I've had an op-ed, Howie, I guess, is posting them in the chat. Uh, I've had an op-ed on uh, uh, online uh, LA politics blog that's called City Watch LA that is largely read by people who are involved in LA politics going ahead and making all of these arguments. So what's happened with this? The, the difficulty that we're having right now is that the goal of the ad hoc committee is to put two ballot measures on in 2024, one to enlarge the council and one for an IRC. And for a long time, Common Cause and some of the other groups in LA and in California, frankly, have been focusing on independent redistricting and not looking at proportional representation. And as Greens, we've been very frustrated that a lot of these folks have been willing to accept the limitations of single seat districts, which Howie brought out in, in his comments. And many of us have felt like, even from those who are very progressive in the good government movement, they're willing to accept trying to get the best Democrats and haven't been willing to look beyond that for proportional representation. So there hasn't been a lot of groundwork within the electoral reform uh, community. And often what we've been told is, well, yeah, proportional representation is interesting, but you need to wait on the sidelines because independent redistricting is more important. So making the argument now that you can't meet the goals of the California Voting Rights Act with single seat districts and that it will not resolve the tensions and the ugly racial hate competition that we've had in Los Angeles um, has been a very strong counter argument that we've been making. The ad hoc committee, uh, after having several meetings run by the um, by the committee and the legislative analyst's office there, or the chief legislative analyst, excuse me, uh, that's what it's called in LA, have scheduled a meeting for August 10th. And we had asked for a presentation along uh, Fair Vote had also um, asked for a presentation, Fair Rep LA, which is an incredible organization and you should look them up as well. Um, they had all asked for, or we had all asked for presentations at this August 10th meeting, which was supposed to be for civic organizations to make their own case. And unfortunately we were not um, allowed to, to do that. And the Los Angeles Times is, their editorial board is looking at doing an op-ed on the process. And one of the examples that we've referred to is Portland, Oregon recently voted to double the size of their council and go from single seat districts to proportional rank choice voting. That was the Charter Review Commission that they set up was led by people of color. And the LA Times is looking at that process. And I've sent in, I, I know the editor that used to, she actually used to cover me when I was on the city council in Santa Monica. Um, I've sent in the op-eds that I've done on that, and we're hoping the LA Times comes out and saying what the ad hoc commission is doing is not good enough. So one of the challenges, and I, I know I'm getting close to the end of my time, but I'll say one of the challenges that we're dealing with here is because there hasn't been enough work in the past, um, the universe of possibilities uh, has been smaller, and we've had to do more work in this process to open people's eyes to how PRCV, proportional rank choice voting, 
would work. A lot of people have been getting into it. And one of the things we've had to deal with is people have said, oh, look, communities of color aren't yet sold on RCV and you really need to wait and um, wait for them to take the lead on this. Well, what we found here actually is that a lot of the organizers of color in LA, now that we've been making the case for this, are actually thinking it's a good idea. And what that's telling us is that while we have to work in coalition with people as Greens, we have a unique experience because we've been politically excluded and we need to be bolder and make the case for RCV. And we'll find that other people um, who will see the benefits of a proportional system will get behind it, even if they haven't been exposed to it because they've been operating in good faith within the duopoly and trying to do the best they can there. Um, the other thing I'll mention then about um, Santa Monica and the California Voting Rights Act uh, that Linda brought up is there have been a lot of lawsuits in California with the idea that single seat winner take all districts, excuse me, excuse me, that, that at large municipal elections, they're nonpartisan, have been disempowering particularly Latino communities around the state. And the California Voting Rights Act is a stronger law than the Federal Voting Rights Act. It was enacted in the early 2000s and has been amended a couple times. And at that time, the voting rights community thought that single seat districts to try and draw majority minority districts were the way to go. But in many, many communities, you can't draw a majority minority district because the protected class is spread out over the area. And as Greens, we've been arguing that proportional representation through PRCV for cities is a better um, response to allow such communities to just go ahead and organize themselves, even if they are spread around a, a city. The problem that we've had with the Voting Rights Act is that what is called a safe harbor, the only safe harbor under the law is if you pass districts. And if you don't pass districts, but you pass proportional representation, then the plaintiffs can still sue you and say they're not representative enough where uh, the single seat districts are given safe harbor. And once the city passes those, nothing can be changed. In Santa Monica, where I'm from, there is a CVA, CV are a lawsuit against it. It's going to the California Supreme Court. We are arguing that one, we're actually not in violation, but two, um, we are hoping, because we've looked at proportional representation for our city, we're hoping that if we prevail in this case, it's going to compel the legislature to add proportional representation, PRCV, for cities as a safe harbored remedy to actual violations. The California Supreme Court is going to issue their ruling in September. To close, and I know how he's going to talk about this as well, but our National Green Party does not, surprisingly, does not have an electoral reform committee. There was a, a proposal from my state party years ago in California. The National Committee did not approve it. And in response, uh, I've started an email list on Rise Up for interesting interesting. Looks like Michael froze, but he's setting up an email list. And we're asking people on this call that want to be part of that discussion on electoral reform, particularly ranked choice voting and proportional representation. Uh, put your email in the chat, and we'll gather those after this uh, session and uh, get you on the list. I know some of you already put your name in there. If you don't want to be on the list, uh, put that in the chat too. And I guess Michael's. Doing okay from a phone from Vietnam, but uh, looks like technology cut him off. So we have time for discussion. Yeah, it looks like he just, just there he is coming back. Uh, he's smiling. You want to finish up, Michael? I just told them to put their names in the chat. If they want to be on the email list. Uh, you're muted. There we go. Did I drop off when I was talking about the email list? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can carry the rest of that. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I made the point. We need we need the list nationally because our national party doesn't have an, an electoral reform committee, which is mind blowing since how we mentioned at the beginning that our electoral success. Okay. Well. Um... There he is back. 
You froze up for a second, uh, Michael. Oh shoot. Okay. Um, all I was saying is that we we need a elect. We don't have an electoral reform committee for the national party. It's remarkable, and this list is the chance for all of us Greens around the country to network together on these issues and hopefully bring back another proposal to get such one. Because as Howie mentioned at the beginning, having a more fair and representative electoral system is a key to us winning our fair share of representation in the country. Over. Okay, well, we got about uh, 35 minutes, uh, 40 minutes for uh, discussion. So let's, uh, if you want to speak, you know how to use the uh, the sign that says you, you raise your hand. It's under the actions at the bottom. And you click on that and it says raise hand. And we'll take people in the order. And, you know, you can share what you're doing, where you're at. You can ask us questions or you can make a comment. And I'm going to time you. So let's limit each person to three minutes max. Uh, and start going so nissan you're first yeah so i just had a quick question on your your uh thoughts on star voting and how that played a role into this quick simple well my reaction is i think people get ranked choice voting where they just rank their choices in in order and state their preferences than star voting where you have a certain number of votes and you uh, give it to candidates. You, as I understand, you can give more than one vote to some candidate. Um, it just gets a lot more complicated and it's less intuitive and people don't understand the results as well. Okay. But that's that's my thought. I don't know if Linda, Linda, you got your hand up? Yeah, uh, so one of the things um, my organization has done is the deep dive into the different types of voting. And, you know, they all have different uses in different types of direct democracy. So that's really exciting. We've developed kind of a flow chart to help people pick which method to use when. But in re representative democracy, for one thing, we need um, to uh, comply with one person, one vote. So if we got an alternative voting method passed, that didn't do that, it would get clawed back um, in a lawsuit. So there's that one reason. And also with the scoring method, it um, plays into uh, some, there's some strategies that can get used. So that's the, the short answer of why it's, um, people tend to gravitate towards ranked choice when it comes to purport to uh, direct democracy or to representative democracy, thanks. Howie, okay. there's a woman, Linda Lance, that's trying to speak, but her hand thing doesn't work. So just to let you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, Orlando had his hand up, then we'll go to Linda. Hey, Howie, I just want to say, man, you're continuing the great work and a great job and your leadership and everyone on this panel. Great service, great education, and I appreciate y'all all. From Oakland, California, big salute to everyone. That's it? You just wanted to give us our propers? Well, thank uh, yeah. you. Yeah, Howie, you know, you come a long ways, and I respect you out of a lot of these folks because you really diversity, you really talk that talk, but you really walk that walk, and I really respect it coming from you, knowing you for the last four or five years, but you the truth. That's why I respect you and everyone else on here, but mainly you, you the truth, brother. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, Nissan, did you want to get back in? Or is your is yeah, that yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah actually what would you say to the people uh that are really up for star voting say uh they criticism them of rcb uh as a system that actually loses votes uh i don't know if i could do their argument justice but they say the way that rcb has been implemented in many of the states already that it it people's votes have been completely discounted. Um, I think what you're I, talking I about. You heard that argument before. Uh, I don't want to make that argument. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not near four against either one, but I, I'm hoping you heard the argument. 
I think you're talking about exhausted. So exhausted votes. So people rank yes. and then they end their rankings and then they're basically saying none of the above. Yeah. So the vote doesn't count for the winner in the end or one of the losers in the end because they stopped transferring their vote. And Linda's a nerd on these things. So maybe she wants to add. Sure, absolutely. Um, so every uh, voting method has its drop off or its um, fails on participation, if you will. And so what we know is that ranked choice is the most effective way. It has the least drop off or, you know, inact ballots becoming inactive. So uh, we and so as we have these, um, you know, a Slack or I don't know if we're going to do a Dropbox, a Slack or a Google or how we're going to set it up. But uh, my organization has some data to share out with other folks on that. So we can, you know, everybody else doesn't have to go through the process of uh, kicking the tires because our crew has done that for since 2016. Okay, so uh, I see some hanging hands. Orlando, you want to get back in? Okay. I was next. <clears throat> oh, Linda, of course. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, Mike mentioned he was uh, kind of uh, waking up to the fact that we haven't been doing this, and I'm in the same situation. I'm thinking back. I joined the movement in 1960. And for ever since 1960, the left has either abstained from the elections, voted Democratic Party, or um, small numbers would go into either socialist groups or the Green Party, and never became effective because of the two party system. And yet, we never collectively challenge that system that was making us practically impotent. And it's dawning on me, we've wasted so much time. I don't know if it's even too late, but it looks like we're experiencing a wave and a change that people do want more democratic elections. And I'm so glad that Howie organized this. And proposing a committee to deal with it for the Green Party, but I think we have to build a coalition. We have to reach out to, there are liberal and progressive organizations uh, I discovered when we organized a left elect conference in 2015 that do want more democratic elections. And by ourselves, we're not gonna change this. It has to be a coalition effort uh, on a big scale and going after big name figures who are would uh, represent, say, a coalition. So I, I'm all for it. I think there's no way out of the impasse that the left is in um, because we are still discounted because people think they're throwing their vote away. And it it's, uh, just makes everything stall. I mean, and the alternative that the left chose over the last 60 years that I've been watching, is they go out and do mass action against the people that they've put in office. And it, and it just never ends. And we're always in that box. And then um, uh, uh, co just to wind up, I think in the election campaigns, front and center, our candidates have to talk about the fact that we don't have democratic elections. Usually they don't do that. They aren't exposing the rotten system that we have to put up with and then we get blamed for being spoilers. Sometimes we do, but I think it ought to be front and center because people don't understand why the Green Party is so small. They don't get it. They don't know what we go through. A lot of people don't know that Nader got sued. A lot of people don't know we get kicked off the ballot. A lot of people don't know that every single state has a different ballot uh, access law. And uh, we've got to start our campaign talks with saying that. 
that this has got to become a central issue in the elections, not just the political oh, so-called issues. So um, I'm excited. I think if we can broaden this out to more than the Green Party and be the initiators of a coalition, it will gain us respect and influence. So that's it. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up is Selena. Hi, um, I just had a question about um, uh, the ranked choice voting. I was doing the booth uh, here in Ohio with Ranked to Vote Ohio, and um, someone did come up to, to our booth at the community festival about star voting. And I did ask them, like, you know, um, if they considered the border count method with ranked choice voting that was more aligned with the star voting. and and considering the fact that ranked choice voting has two main counting methods that is least as easy on the voter that is still ranked choice voting on their end. Now, I wasn't sure about the border count method, but it seems like it's more aligned with star voting and approval voting. And it may be more favorable for multi-seat elections versus single seat. So, the counting methods are not really talked about that much with rent choice voting, but there's more than one counting method. So I just wanted uh, any feedback on that. How about you, Linda? You're the one that's done the deep dive on these questions. Yeah, yeah. And so the board account is um, doesn't deliver the same proportional results that um, the method that's used in Australia and um, Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, and actually a number of places in Europe use it. Um, it's called single transferable vote. So the name does not flow trippingly off the tongue, but that's what um, Mike's been talking about with uh, proportional rank choice voting. And that was the original version created back in the 1830s. And so, I mean, this, this was actually used by Abraham Lincoln in the Whig party, it is that old. Um, so I'd say it delivers better political results than the board account. And that's gonna give us Greens more power to, you know, combat, um, slow down climate change and other things that are coming for our species. So long story short, um, the best case scenario is STV. Oh, Elizabeth dropped it in. Um, yeah, board is only used in Malta and it's uh, it has problems. Michael, you want to respond. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, yeah we um, I just want to mention that Fair, Fair Vote has done a position paper on RCV and star voting. And I would recommend people simply to go into their browser and put in fair vote, RCV, star voting. And there's a paper that goes into this in great depth and they conclude RCV is a better approach. So go ahead and look for that. Okay, Jonathan. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I live in Klamath Falls, Oregon. It's a more rural conservative area. Um, I work with the Democratic Socialists of America. Oregon this year uh, on our next ballot will be voting on ranked choice voting. Um, and I'm interested in what strategies you've seen work, what we should probably be thinking about as we push forward for this. Um, Klamath Falls is more rural, like 70% conservative. It's definitely not Portland. Uh, there's actually a lot of um, tension between the urban and rural. Um, and I, I'm curious about ways to advocate for ranked choice voting in areas like this um, that you've seen work. So if you have thoughts there, that'd be great. Um, Jonathan, are you familiar with Blair Bobier from the Pacific Green Party? No, I'll write that name down, though. Yeah, Blair really has been working in Oregon on this for, there's an interview with him from a group called SOS Democracy that you should look up, <clears throat> excuse me. What is it, Blair Bobier? I'm, I'm trying to spell it in the- Yeah, yeah. I think I got it's it right. It's 
B O B I E R. Look, if you, if, if, if Jonathan, if you want to get your email in the chat to Howie, I can get you connected to Blair via email. I have it on my, my laptop. And Thank so, you. put it in the chat. Now. Okay, John. Please copy it down right now. I'm on my phone. My my laptop is in the shop. And one of the things, uh, two of the things I'd suggest, Jonathan, is um, I dropped in the chat the conservative case for ranked choice voting, that was written by a senior fellow at the Independence Institute. Um, that goes a long way, and also um, what how ranked choice got passed in um, Maine was that they did just for fun elections. So they did a bunch of beer elections, you know, people getting flights of beer and then they show people the results. So what RCV for Colorado does for voter education is we do people's choice awards, whatever's fun will rank. So we're out at like we rank, you know, mountain recreation at the uh, Western conservative summit in June. And also in June, we ranked the uh, drag performers. So we go wherever the people are and rank whatever they're interested in. So I think, um, you know, people are interested in fairness. Um, there's a no RCV movement that Sarah Palin's active in. So a lot of those folk have the talking points. So you have to be ready for all of those. But it's like, it's not fair and it's hard and you can't audit it. Well, yeah, you can't Yeah, You know, here are the facts. Here's the studies. It's easy. You know, when you have a table where you're ranking candy, small children will come up and rank. So it's hard for them to say it's hard. You know, you show how it's fair. And then, um, yes, even um, there were risk limiting audits in the um, uh, presidential uh, primaries that used it. So yeah, they get audited. They've been audited in San Francisco. So, you know, point people to resources, but, you know, try to keep arguments to a minimum. Do, uh, does the Green Party have brochures or pamphlets or a, or any organization that you know of that we can use as uh, canvas material? Uh, Maricol used to have a lot of good stuff. So much is online now. They're I don't know if they're they're producing them now, but I agree, you know, we need to be more on the street and face to face and, you know, hand literature is good for that. Um, but we got this uh, little working group going on the email list. Maybe we can produce something or reproduce something that's been done, you know, with new graphics or something. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're up next. Mm. But you're muted. There you go. That's me. We shouldn't spend so much time denying the spoiler ac accusation. And you know, it's funny, I mean, every four years, of course, now we're in that situation again, and, and you listen to the uh, independent media and it's like one after another, oh, you know, Nader didn't really spoil and here's all the statistics and Jill Stein, you know, the system, the way it, it's a bad system and we, we could deal with this a lot more easily. It's a bad system. It lends itself to spoiling. Of course, there's going to be what they call spoiling. If we deny it, we sort of say we we don't really have an impact uh, in the system. So so that's my thing. <laughs> don't don't go around trying so hard to deny the spoiling. Just just tell them it's a terrible system that lends itself to that thing that they hate and they need to change the system. Over. <laughs> I completely agree with that. I, when I've run for office, I've had my campaign manager and senior advisors saying, don't don't admit there's a spoiler problem. And I'd say everybody knows there's a spoiler problem. Yeah. What we should say is we got the solution to it. Right. We got an answer. And Cornell West, if he's the candidate, should challenge uh, Biden to join him in getting rid of the Electoral College and going to a ranked choice national popular vote. I think that ought to be his answer because he's going to get hit with the spoiler thing every time he's on particularly mainstream media, but certainly the progressive media. I sure got it in 2020. I think that's the answer, but hopefully he'll have a bigger platform than I did because I was ignored. He's he's getting more mainstream media coverage every day than I got the whole campaign. So, but yeah, I agree totally with you on that, Steve. We got to say we got the solution, not that there isn't a problem. 
So anybody else want to chime in on that question? Okay, Nissan, you got your hand. Yeah, up. I I would like to mention. Can, can, can I just Go mention ahead. on that point that? Who, who, is that sorry, how, who do you want to go next? Well, Nissan had his hand up, but who was speaking? Was that you, Steve? Uh, it was me, oh, Mike. It was Michael. Yeah, Mike go ahead, Michael. Michael. Also we'll comment on that point. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted I to. Well, I wasn't wanted... Wait, let made. Michael go and then you can go, Nissan. Oh, sorry, go okay. ahead. I'll wait. Okay, Nissan. Go, Michael. Go first. Go ahead, Michael. Go first. Okay, I, I think there are two points to be made. Um, I think Steve Welter's point is correct that we shouldn't deny that there's a dynamic, but at the same time that we point to the problem with the electoral system, it's important for us to point out that the Democrats are pathetic, that they blame their problems on the tiny Green Party instead of their messaging. Over. Oh. Yeah. Nissan, Steve, is yeah, I, I want to give an analysis of that, and uh, um, and I, I think you should focus on going and getting more independent media coverage, because I think that uh, you, the information you're giving out here is very useful and needs to be heard in more independent spaces. Uh, enjoying your work you're doing so far. I unfortunately I don't hear from you much, um, and I also think that you. Know, it is a good idea to spin it uh, to like, you know, in, in terms of like Cornell West, to spin it as, yes, there's the problem where I have the solution. That, that kind of worked with Elizabeth Warren a bit until she screwed up. So that, 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 that is a good method. But it, it also should put an onus on, more onus on like the, on the other presence to fix it. It's like, yeah, well, you could solve this problem right now. Like you have the power to solve it right now. So I, I thought that just adding that on top, that's 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 all I had to say. Okay, thank you. Nikhil Ananda, you had your hand up. There we go. Thank you, Howie. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and Linda in Colorado. Uh, just a really quick, um, I'll show my bias for Cornell. On the other hand, the Green Party has not chosen our uh, nominee as of yet. And there's one person on this call and uh, a couple other people that have already said they're seeking the nomination from the Green Party. So let's walk our talk. As much as we're biased about who we'd like to see in 2024, we do not, as of now, have a presidential candidate. Uh, and uh, thank you for giving a uh, mahalo and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Aloha. Okay, you know Nikhil Anand is from Hawaii. Anybody else got got something to say? We still have 15 minutes on our assigned time. Okay, here we go. Uh, I think Nissan's hand is hanging, so let's go with Linda. Linda, your hands up. Who? Linda Lance. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I heard Jill give a wonderful answer to the spoiler argument the other day. She talked about how Obama lost the midterm elections and gave the figures of how many uh, seats they lost from governor to uh, Congress and said that third parties had nothing to do with that. And we can really hit the Democratic Party on their rotten record. That's the way you answer it and point to the 40% of Americans who don't vote and say all our voters wouldn't vote unless um, uh, we were running. So it democratizes the vote. There, there are good answers, but this, the point is, is to use the campaigns where they're local or, or national to campaign for democratic election issues and talk about ranked choice voting when you're running. It's, it's got to be done and we haven't been doing it effectively and the entire left has totally not done it at all. <clears throat> 
Okay, Nikhil Nanda, did you want to get back in? Quickly, uh, uh, Linda's points are well taken. Our challenge, and I'm like a broken record, is the media listening to us because Steve made a great comment. We're never, you know, let's not uh, hide from being spoilers. Then on the other hand, we say, yes, but the statistics are we don't spoil. So we talk about a spoiled system and many of us know it's a spoiled system, but it's unbelievable now the discussions I'm seeing here. Oh no, but this year we cannot let, uh, you know, uh, former President Trump get elected. So this year we have to. And I wrote, oh, yeah, that's right. In 2000, we couldn't have George Bush. And 2002, we could, four, blah, blah, blah. So we, we, our arguments are so clear and sane and on point, yet media doesn't pick it up. Like you're hearing now, Cornell is getting so much more media coverage than how he ever got now. And depending on what you listen to, the left wing media, oh, he's going to spoil everything, uh, you know, blah, 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 and Trump will be. And then the right wing media, so et cetera. So, yeah, we just have to. I like that someone said we need to create our own media because we know what the facts are and truth are, uh, but we're not going to see it on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, thank you, uh, you know, Howie and Michael in particular for everything you guys do. Aloha. Hey, Nissan, you want to get back in? Yeah, so I want to uh, flow up what, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the guy's name, Mo Molly and what Linda was saying. I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name, bro. I, 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 I don't know how to pronounce the name. Uh, and yeah, so, so it is crucial to have a, a media messaging and infrastructure. Uh, I'm actually working on doing that right now in communication platform. But the important thing is also not just to have media outlets, but also have a concise message that you can spread the media outlets too, to, to, to keep the narrative. The, the idea here is to both capture and then control the narrative. Those require two separate things, two separate skill sets in order to do. You need to be able to understand what your opponents are going to argue and figure out a response, but you also have to organize and keep on message and make sure the message is crystal clear so it can't be, and then just repeat it ad nauseum, right? Because that's basically psychology and what's playing in the psychology here. Because a lot of people that do do politics and do vote are not really engaged in a way where they actually think, they're really thinking of, you know, the pros and cons. They're really just, you know, playing the HUD, you know, uh, what we have called the bandwagon effect. And they're basically, so again, like the same idea of playing for a team. So uh, so you gotta have to have a clear message, a clear character that you're presenting to these people if you wanna get them to get on board and vote. And then they're not gonna be able to make the arguments themselves. So that's why you have to repeat them ad nauseum. So when something tell, so when somebody tells them this, they repeat the same message to the other person and then that grows. And 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 you get not you, you get the secondary effect where you not you not only get the effect of getting the listeners of the actual firsthand you know media, but then you're getting the people from secondhand who are listening from people that heard that coverage, and hearing the talking points over and over until it becomes the dub position. So this this is something we try to do in Justice Democrats, uh, and it, and it was pretty effective for uh, for the most part. So I think that's something you also got to think of and uh, figure out how you're gonna set that up. But you're gonna need to have two completely different teams for that. One specifically for crafting messages and responses and another team to organize and control messaging. Okay, Matt, that's all. So Michael Feinstein, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I just wanna to mention two strategic things to think about. First, how many of you have written or are considering writing an op-ed or a letter to the editor about ranked choice voting, dealing with the spoiler question, and or why there should be proportional representation. The interest, and in, yes, we don't have a nominee yet, but the interest in the Cornell West um, candidacy and the issue about how that would affect the vote total in 2024 is going to create the potential 
for more attention to be brought to elected reform. So what you can do in your local community is to write something and get it published and the editors are gonna be much more receptive. And um, you can be copying a lot of the stuff that is already written there. Howie and I have written a lot. Um, hopefully you saw the, the couple of articles I wrote there in the chat about LA. So that's, that's one thing. And I'm right now working on a piece about um, NPR doing very biased coverage of the spoiler question and why they aren't covering the electoral reform. The other thing I want to mention, and to Linda from the 1960s or being organized, I forgot your last name, to her point about trying to seek coalitions, familiar for you on the municipal level, familiarize yourself with how a charter review commission can get established in your city. Because once a charter review commission is convened by your city council, then it is a forum for all kinds of discussion about electoral reform. And that's a formal official venue for coalition building because then you can come and talk about ranked choice voting and how it works in your city. But if you're just gonna go and say, hey, we want our CV, then you're trying to win the argument on the basis of a specific reform before you have made the argument that there's a need for reform and gotten community buy-in. So Charter Review Commission, look it up, advocate for it in your, your, your local community. Over. Good point. While we got a pause, I'll get to the people. A uh, reminder that we're taking names, put your name and email in the chat. If you wanna be on a listserv where we're gonna continue to talk about and work on these electoral reforms. So Nikila Nanda, your hand is up. Thank you, Howie. And Michael, as always, brilliant uh, uh, suggestions. So I'll toot my horn for a second. I've run for office for years, always mentioning ranked choice voting. Our state legislature had, uh, for the last couple of years, the Greens have been supporting, as has, um, uh, oh, I forgot the other organizations right now, uh, for ranked choice voting. And the last two sessions of our Hawaii state legislature had ranked choice voting, killed it. They had a, a, a small, oh, they, they passed a small one that's only for special elections. We had a charter commission. It's not our city because we don't have cities in Hawaii. Uh, our county charter commission, I testified numerous times on that. There were a whole bunch of people testified for ranked choice voting, that died. Uh, and so uh, we had a constitution, uh, we had um, uh, uh, the state, had for constitutional amendments that died. So yeah, um, it's uh, sadly frustrating. I can, Linda must have started working when she was three years old, uh, since she started in the 60s. It's frustrating that we've been working on these things for so long. And then he, sadly in Hawaii, everyone thinks so progressive, but ranked choice voting constantly gets uh, killed. As does legalizing marijuana, just for a point. Anyway, thank you guys, aloha. Well, seeing no hands, I, I, I'll just comment going back to the spoiler question. I was on a discussion earlier today with people that consider themselves revolutionary socialists. And they were arguing that we got to vote for Biden to stop Trump. Yeah. And I had a lot of arguments against that, but I kind of put them under the theme of Greens don't spoil elections, we improve elections. And I gave them examples. In this district I live in, in Syracuse, the only time a Democrat has won in the last 50 years is when a green ran. We didn't split the vote, we changed the whole conversation, forced the centrist Democrat to deal with our progressive demands like Medicare for all and a Green New Deal. And he sounded a lot better than he, when he was just running against the right wing Republican. So we got six to 8% as Greens and the Democrat crushed the Republican in a landslide. And then we didn't run and the Republican won. So that's an example. Another example, 1948 campaign, Henry Wallace. Truman was getting his butt kicked. He was way behind in the polls to Dewey. And then in the late summer, he, uh, after the convention where civil rights was a controversy, he desegregated the army, picked that up from Henry Wallace. And then he adopted Henry Wallace's New Deal programs, like what we today call Medicare for All. And Truman caught up to Dewey and beat him. So Wallace, if he hadn't been there, Truman would have taken his left for granted. 
Same thing, Ralph Nader. I mean, we know Gore actually won that. When you when they went back and counted the Florida vote, Gore won the popular vote. It was close, but Gore won. And Nader forced Gore to come out. I forget what his slogan was, but he came out with a very populist message after Labor Day. And he'd been behind Bush and he almost caught up. So those are examples. So I'm going to write an article probably for Counterpunch called Greens Don't Spoil Elections, They Improve Them. Yeah. But uh, that's another you know, part of the discussion you can. But I think at a second level, I think the first level is the immediate answer is we got a solution to the spoiler problem. And if you really want to get rid of us as spoilers, Biden or whoever you're running against in the Democratic Party, join us in pushing for ranked choice voting. You should so, you should adopt a hashtag that says vote green, not blue. <laughs> okay. I'm not even sure what a hashtag actually does. That's but that's my age showing. Uh, Nissan, you're you're up and then we'll be at our formal ending time, although I'm willing to stay as long as people want. So Nissan, yeah. go ahead. I, I just thought I might offer a recommend oh, recommendation. Because you were talking about writing an op-ed. And with the information you have and the way you talk about it, I, I believe it would be far more effective to reach more people if you would make more a, of a video presentation, uh, you know, like a, 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 good, a good example of this was Matt Offala. He, he did a tremendous job during the Bunny campaign and some of the stuff that he made was unbelievable. So I, I think if, if you would just make those type of things like in the video format and then put it on like YouTube and stuff with links and stuff like that so people could watch it, you could have a lot more people make, have the argument heard and listen to. I, it, 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 it's, just, it's just my recommendation because nobody's going to really stop and read an op-ed. I mean, at least not any of the newer generation or... The last generation, maybe the older generation, I could I could see that happening, but the vast amount of people are not going to stop and read an op-ed. It's just it's not happening. I think there's good advice for everybody. I'm not running for anything right now, but uh, well, not, not you don't have to run, but but the fact is that you you could you have the ability to explain the position, and I think that that's a really good strength that you have with the knowledge you have and the way you cite, but just putting it in writing is really taking away you know the the emotion and the and the passion oh. and 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 the visual like like straight up in your face like i get it moment because yeah somebody put in the chat uh some of the stuff i've done on that is online i've seen TikTok, it tiktok is where you really want to be and i haven't figured that one out yet, but I, I agree with your general recommendation. Do you need help with that? I mean, I'm an IT guy. I, I could, I could, I mean. I'm, my problem is I'm up to my eyeballs, just trying to keep up with what I've already agreed to do. But uh, okay. put your, put your, uh, you know, name in the chat. If you don't want to be already there. Okay. Then uh, my I'll, email's there too. I'll, I'll take note of that. Um, so, our official time is up. I don't know how long they're going to keep the Zoom call open, but uh, I'm willing to go if people, more people are. Uh, we did have up to 33. I saw we're down to 24. So uh, anybody? Yeah, I want to talk. Yeah, I, I want to talk. I, I know everybody says we don't have a candidate yet, but I think um, I'm since I'm working on the West campaign, I, I, I want to talk about it, and I think that's all right to do. Uh, we already know that Socialist Alternative and the Peace and Freedom Party are supporting his campaign, so it's already a coalition. And I think based on the left elect experience we had where over uh, 20 organizations uh, supported a coalition for independent political action, both local, um, state, and federal, uh, to push and collaborate with other leftists who wanted independent political action. And I think that's the way the Green Party has to go. I think we have to uh, look beyond ourselves and get the rest of the left that's open to independent political action, and there are already two 
very impressive experienced uh, forces in socialist alternative and peace and freedom that are going to join with the Green Party on a campaign for West. And that can be expanded and it should be expanded. Um, I'm, if anybody wants to work on this, they can get in touch with me, Linda Thompson at lthompson321 uh, at aol.com and uh, help, help me broaden a coalition out. And I think um, when Syriza was formed, which was a third party in Spain, they had a opening founding conference because at that time, they already had Zoom. In 2015, when Left Elect got together, we didn't have Zoom, so we had 250 people in Chicago. But um, if now that we have Zoom, we could have an in-person and a hybrid conference with Zoom, and we could get thousands of people there in a coalition event. And the centerpiece of that could be pushing democratic elections and democratic media. We all, I'd like to also see alternative media included in such an event because democracy now is by and large has become a pro-democratic party uh, or so-called alternative. They're, they're terrible, most of them. Uh, Amy Goodman is, you know, a little non-committal, but Jesus, uh, most of the shows are pro-democratic party and they're supposed to be democratic and they're supposed to be leftist and they just aren't. And nobody's challenging that or them. And I think we have to get on those talk shows and challenge those uh, people who are just openly advocating for the democratic party. It's, it's ridiculous. They're, they're not getting okay. challenged. That, that, uh, got a couple more hands raised. Uh, uh, I think let's go with Jasmine, because I know she's put her hat in the ring and let her respond, and then we'll go with Rick. Just to clarify for everybody, I use they, them pronouns. Um, going forward, if people could try to remember that. But what I wanted to ask Miss Linda was, we have reached out to the West campaign to schedule a debate as you are um, speaking for the party. Can you let us know when you guys will be able to formally respond to our request for a debate? If that's directed to me, I'm not formally speaking for the uh, West campaign. That uh, you'd have to talk to Anahita is his wife is the campaign organizer. Oh, I apologize. I thought you were saying that you were with the West campaign. In that I, case, I am working I for say, it, but I'm not official. Got you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Jasmine Sherman. I am seeking the nomination with the Green Party. I know a lot of you are very set on Dr. West, but I would hope that you would be open to hearing about more candidates, especially candidates that are actively seeking your support at your meetings and at your events. Um, I would hope that at least I could get people to sign my petition for signatures. I just need to collect a hundred of those and that is my focus. Um, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Jasmine. Um, Rick Greenblatt, I'll go with you. And then Michael had his hand up. I just had a quick factual question. Um, Linda said that Peace and Freedom has endorsed the Cornell West campaign. Um, I, I don't know anything about that. I know in California, where there is probably the stronghold of the Peace and Freedom Party, that Greens have been in discussion with them. Do you have any uh, a link or something else that would describe um, the endorsement? I don't know how formal it is. I just, uh, uh, Jill has told me that they're, they're behind the West campaign. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, we, they, they, so they haven't actually formally endorsed it. Right, yeah. Okay, Nissan, you, your hands up. Yes, uh, this is uh, responding to something Linda was saying. Uh, she is correct to saying democracy. Howie, do you want me to go next? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mike, I forgot. You uh, didn't have a physical hand up. Go ahead. It's your turn, then, Nissan. Okay. Uh, Wait, my turn on Michael's. I'm, I'm confused. I just two, two brief. 
points. Um, I would encourage on the Democracy Now track, I would encourage Linda to, to write it. Uh, looks like Michael froze. So, Howie, what do you want to do? Uh, you froze, so go back, start over. Okay. Okay. I want to encourage on the Democracy Now front for Linda to actually write a, a column and lay out a few examples of mm. where Democracy Now has been overly focusing on the Democrats and how a broader approach would be good for political debate and there are a lot of places where that could get published, even if it's online sites, and then you have something in hand to share. But the other thing I wanted to mention for people to follow in terms of coalitions on the left is that in the Netherlands, the Green Party, which officially is called the Green Left or Groen Links, um, is going to be in coalition this year for the first time with the Labour Party, the PVDA in the Netherlands and it's a formal coalition. They're gonna have a joint electoral list. Now we don't have that possibility under US law, but watching that example of how those two parties work together is something for progressives in the US to keep an eye on. So Crone Links is G-R-O-E-N and then Links, L-I-N-K-S. Links is the word for that. Put that in the it, chat. Yeah, well, I'm, it's a little I can harder do it. I'm doing this on my phone, but I can do um, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, and there's a lot written on this. There's a lot written on this. So, it's something to look up and follow. Over. Okay, Nissan? Yeah, so uh, going, uh, continuing on the, the topic of democracy now, and this actually goes beyond democracy now. Yeah, the, the, we also have to keep in mind that there, that there are continuous bad faith actors. And our systems are getting co-opted, and this is something that they have perfected. Yeah. Uh, so it's very important to, you know, keep on guard and also to to trying to uh, engage with some engage with a system that's already co-opted to try to bring them back. I would have to say it's just a waste of time. You know, stop trying to make your enemy your friend. You know, that's that's not really. I would say a wise uh, and efficient use of your time and energy. What you should be worried about is trying to get more people on your side, right? And to have people detracted from those resources. Because when you when you you when you're putting more, you know, uh, more more uh, attention to these things, you're effectively getting them paid. So you're incentivizing them to do that more so what you should be doing is trying to disincentivize them from building up your own systems and having and then attracting their listeners to you that way they were forced to compete so so so, so i mean it's good to go and talk to you and go talk to people that have opposed views that's fine i'm all for that i'm not saying not to go to news and not to go to like uh 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 Fox News or whatever, whatever, you know, but, you know, not every news and not, not every outlet is going to be your friend and not every uh, and not any, any people that you think your enemy is going to be is going to fight you. Well, you know, so, yeah, so it, I, it's good to understand what like where you're going there. Yeah, I'd like to uh, the issue. I listen to them a lot. And I listen to different shows, so I know it's pretty much across the board that they have changed because they used to have Ralph Nader on, they used to have Jill on. Howie, you got on a few times, right? Not since uh, it, 2015. And then they dropped you. And uh, they had the Libertarians, I think, and Greens on a couple of campaigns. And they used to uh, have Nader on very regularly. They dropped Greenwald. They dropped uh, Chris Hedges. All the people who have a left critique of the Democratic Party are pretty much out of their uh, interviews now. They used to have debates. So they're under pressure. I don't know if it's trust funds or if they're uh, 
endorsers or supporters are putting pressure on Amy or if they're just caving in to the pressures themselves. I, I don't know, but I, I hear what you're saying, Nissan, about not being, um, you know, being diplomatic, shall we say, about it, but I think that we shouldn't let them off the hook because the name is Democracy Now!, and they're not talking about ranked choice voting, and they're not talking and having left candidates on, and they've pretty much wiped out the left wing point of view. And uh, I think that we should be talking about it to put pressure on them. I don't think they're irredeemable because they do have some good people in there and they do have some good shows. So I think I think it's, I think it's very worth worth addressing. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to I just want to respond that quickly. Then. On, Nissan, um, we're we're starting to lose a lot of people. I. I need technical help. Maybe you can provide it, Nissan. I need, there's a way to copy the chat and I'm not able to do it, but I know there's a way. Somebody uh, here is well, on the computer, you would go to the bottom left, uh, I'm sorry, right-hand side and there'll be a three dots and you could save the chat and then you could then send that file to wherever and it saves the whole chat. I don't know, I can't do it on the phone I though. See, I don't see save chat, I see chat. Oh. But how, uh, are so you on a phone Howie, or a computer? The, I'm on a computer. He, he sent it to the cloud. So the transcript is already going to be in the recording at the end of this meeting. You'll be able oh, to get the, the copy of the chat, the audio, and the combination chat or visual. Where is that? Once, once you end this Zoom meeting and you close out, it will process in the cloud and those will be available for download to you. You'll even have a code if you want to share it with people. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. I vote just, Sherman in twenty twenty four. We're young enough to know how to do this. <laughs> I'm sure you are. So I will get a link telling me where to find that stuff. Right. Yes. At the end of the meeting, it should pop up for you. Okay. Um, and that will be sent out to us, or what? If if we left our emails. I, I would appreciate if, if if that was sent out. Yeah. I'm on a phone. I can't copy the chat from a phone, yeah. unfortunately. I will say that my staff and I have been collecting the email addresses, so we can definitely forward it to you, Mr. Nissan. We do have your contact information. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. For me, okay. it's probably available. Thank you. Um, before we go, I wonder if uh, Linda or Michael has any last words they want to share. Although, yeah, I see Michael. I don't see Linda. Where's she? So, Michael, any last thoughts? Um, well, I, I think. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, you froze up again. Linda, you go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm really excited about Greens being able to run and Good. win and get our fair share of the say. I'm the really excited that about I'll the question. Add is I'm a great believer as you can tell from my earlier comments in getting published and there I want to encourage everybody who's been on this to sit down and formulate your own local letters to the editor and columns on why electoral reform is important for American democracy and You'll find a lot of editors will be receptive in your state. And it's a great, great way to uh, really exercise your mind. Over. Okay, Linda, go ahead. Yeah, and I um, encourage everyone to get involved in their Oops. state movement for ranked choice voting and to ensure that it includes um, expansion of uh, ballot access and that um, it includes a pathway to proportional representation. That's been a big part of our work in Colorado is making sure that it's written into the rules uh, that we use single transferable vote when we have a multi-winner race and that we're building up the technical capacity to run 
um, proportional representation races in our state. So. Okay, and 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 Anand, uh, Nikolanda, you got a short thing. I see your hand up, and then I'll wrap it up. Very short. Nissan, I sent you a private message twice. I'll read it. I want to thank both Lindas, both of them, for their uh, uh, what they've added. Of course, Mike and uh, Howie and uh, Linda. My suggestion, uh, not uh, is that uh, you contact Amy. And uh, you're so passionate and uh, clear and just right. And she'll either respond or not respond, but let her know what you're saying. And again, thank you so much for this. Aloha. Okay, well, I, I want to go back to the first point I made. And I think this issue of changing our electoral system from an exclusionary winner take all one party districts, it's a farce. We know who's going to win 90%, 95% of the elections before they even happen, because the districts are either majority Democrat or majority Republican. So we have farcical elections, whereas we can change the system so we have an inclusive multi-party democracy. And it's not just the Greens, it's ethnic minorities have been excluded, women who are underrepresented, uh, even the major parties who, members who are minorities in those one party districts. So this is really a revolutionary change and it will open it up do more for the Green Party because we'll get our fair share of representation and power. And I think it ought to be, you know, an issue that we raise at every level, municipal, state, and federal. It ought to be one of our top issues. And you can always challenge your opponent. You know, we're not spoiling the election. We got a solution to spoil the problem. Will you join us in, so in solving the problem? Put them on the spot. So I hope. Uh, the Green Party can do that, and I appreciate everybody who showed up, and uh, I guess have a good annual meeting, and uh, we'll see you wherever, at the barricades, at the banners, online, hopefully more in person, now that COVID is not so bad, although it's still there. So uh, again, thanks everybody, and have a good evening, or whatever time it is where you at. Thanks, Howie. Thank you, Howie. Happy afternoon, everybody.